Today we'll be dealing with the primary reason why a dental patient comes to your uh, clinic, that is orofacial pain or headache. Now being one of the most common kind of uh, symptoms with, uh, with which a patient presents to you, this also presents a big challenge for the uh, dental physician as such to determine the cause of this pain as well as to deal with it effectively. Now in this session we'll be dealing with the primary concepts of uh, pain, especially orofacial pain, its etiological factors or the causes the most common causes uh, with which uh, the patient presents uh, to the physician and how we can deal with it by understanding its exact pathogenesis. Now, according to the definition of pain, which is given by the taxonomical group by International Association for Study of Pain, also called as IASP, if we uh, take a close look with the, uh, to the definition, we can exactly know the ex uh, type of uh, 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 characteristics of the pain which with, uh, with which the patient presents to the dental physician. Now, if you look into the definition, it says it's an unpleasant sensory or emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Now, if you look closely into the definition, we can see it is both a sensory as well as an emotional experience. That means to say, even if there is no evident uh, 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 evidence that there is a kind of wound or a uh, cause for the pain, we, uh, the patient or may also present with a uh, uh, complaint of pain because of its psychological uh, etiology. Now, uh, various definitions have been given to pain and why this has been uh, uh, zeroed upon as the most accepted uh, kind of a definition is because of its theories of pain. Now, the most recent uh, theory of pain, which I'll be talking about later, includes a psychological angle to the uh, human body which might result in pain. Now, dealing with this this kind of pain is much more difficult than actually treating a cause with which, uh, evident cause uh, with which the patient might present with pain. Now, if you look into the physiology of pain, if, uh, if we uh, describe the events after an actual uh, tissue damage or a potential tissue damage, we can categorize it into two phases. The first phase is the initial or the first phase that is your uh, in which the patient uh, uh, describes a fast pain that is it is a very sharp kind of pain a pricking kind of pain and it is uh, acute in nature now after the actual tissue damage occurs the patient comes up with the initial phase then the uh, area of interest goes into the second phase which in which the patient experiences a dull pain which is a constant uh, dull nagging kind of pain which is also called a slow pain now why this uh, difference it is because of the difference in the fibers with which the pain uh, perception is felt into the cns now how is this pain uh, transmitted basically it's all dependent upon the neurotransmitters and the type of fibers uh, with which connects the area of actual damage to the cns or the perceptive uh, focus of the brain now in this these are also called as neurotransmitters now uh, if you look into the uh, picture we can see how a presynaptic neuron in this uh, picture connects with the post uh, synaptic neuron in which the presynaptic vesicles these are the vesicles which contain few chemical substances also called as neurotransmitters which either help in progression of this uh, pain uh, signals or inhibits these kind of pain signals now, if we see the synaptic uh, cleft we can see how these vesicles by exocytosis releases these neuro uh, neurotransmitters into the cleft and this is detected by postsynaptic uh, uh, ligands which detect these neurosynaptors uh, and then carry out the further message. Now as I said these neurotransmitters can uh, work in either ways it can either inhibit the progression of the uh, signal or it can uh, 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 it can act as an adjunct to the progression of the signal that is, if you look at the inhibitory uh, agents, we can, uh, the most common uh, kind of neurotransmitters are serotonin, GABA or endorphins. Uh, endorphins are also called as internal pa uh, pain relievers. That is because it uh, internally the body produces these uh, neurotransmitters which actually inhibit the progression of pain. Now the excitatory agents on the other hand is the uh, acetylcholine, the most common kind of uh, neurotransmitter followed by norepinephrine or glutamate and etc. There are also a third class of agents, also called as inflammatory agents, which can act either as an inhibitory agent or a progressive uh, agent, that is a prostaglandins and brandykinin. Now, all kinds of pain can be uh, broadly classified into three types. That is a central pain, 
or the referred pain or the projected pain. Now, whatever kind of uh, uh, acute pain or chronic pain, all of them have uh, can be uh, broadly classified into these three types according to which we can actually uh, the type of management and the type of cause which pro, uh, which uh, results in uh, this kind of pain can be estimated. Now, if you look into the central pain, it is basically a pain which arises from the central nervous system structures, that is your brain or the spinal cord. And that, because of its uh, connection to the periphery of the uh, body, this pain gets carried out to the peripheral structures and this is called a central pain. On the other hand, we have a projected pain which is more of a localized kind of pain, wherein uh, the pain originates from the uh, uh, kind of uh, the specific nerve and its branches and the parts of uh, the body with which are supplied by this nerve so the pain projects along this uh, along the distribution of the nerve so hence its name or uh, the projected pain now the referred pain is a more uh, classical kind of pain uh, for example uh, if i give an example you are, the most common cause is the uh, myocardial infarction patients wherein the initial type of pain which they experience is pain along at the angle of the mandible. Now this is called a referred pain wherein there is no evident connection between the cause of the pain and the pain which is uh, present uh, which is uh, given out or uh, the complaint of the pain which is given out by the patient. Now the basic cause for this uh, uh, pain at the angle of the mandible in this kind of uh, condition is your acute myocardial infarction but the pain does not project along the uh, distribution of the nerves which uh, uh, supplies the uh, which uh, innervate the uh, myocardial muscles nor it is localized at that particular area this is only a referred kind of pain which is a heterotopic kind of pain and in this case the most typical symptom is if we manipulate the area that is your uh, uh, angle of mandible there is no relieving of the pain nor there is aggravation of the pain since this, that area is not concerned with this kind of pain this is basically uh, depends upon the visceral somites in the embryonic uh, uh, stage wherein the myocard the somite which passes through the myocardium uh, muscle or the heart muscles and the somite which passes through the uh, angle of mandible all arise from the same uh, kind of somite in the early embryonic stage hence this connection now if you look into the pain theories various number of theories have been uh, uh, proposed uh, since the 18th century now the most uh, accepted kind of uh, pain theory is much much more recent given by Melzack and Wall but if you have a look at the uh, previous uh, theories we will get to know the kind of uh, 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 problem which is uh, proje uh, uh, projected by this uh, by understand by proje problem projected to the uh, scientists to understand the nature of pain now if you look at uh, the specificity theory the most uh, the first and the most common uh, accepted kind of uh, uh, theory back in those times was given by René Descartes wherein he says there is a specific thread like connection between the central nervous system and the area upon the skin wherein the pain is originated. Now we all know that this is not true uh, taking into consideration the referred kind of pain or the visceral kind of pain. So that has been uh, uh, negated. Next came the Willem of pattern kind of uh, theory wherein he says it is not necessary that there has to be a uh, actual tissue damage to produce pain in that specific uh, patient. Now this is true in some sense uh, which I will be explaining it later but the reason given uh, by, for this uh, uh, characteristic of pain was wrong uh, as given by uh, William Hull. He says that uh, even if there is an actual uh, tissue damage you need to have a certain limit upon which uh, above which only uh, only above which can pain be experienced by the patient that is to say the intensity the amount of uh, 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 tissue damage and the frequency with which this tissue damage takes place in the human body is directly proportional to the amount of pain which is uh, resultant in the same subject. Now the most accepted kind of uh, theory was given by Melzek and Wall which is also called as gate control theory. Now in this what he says is if you look at this uh, uh, diagram. A, a, most common uh, example or a situation which can uh, directly explain what uh, Melzek and Wall has uh, told us is you, we all know that uh, if you have an actual tissue damage or somewhere in the body the first the immediately after uh, when the patient uh, experiences pain the first thing the patient does is he holds a, uh, a specific area tightly 
Now, why does he hold it uh, tightly? He, that, beca that is because there is a slight relieving of the pain. Now, what is the physiology behind him holding that particular area at which uh, where the actual tissue damage has taken place is explained by this theory. Now, if you see any uh, specific area is both innervated by large fibers and as, as well as soft fibers, uh, large fibers and small fibers. Now, both these fibers terminate in the substantial gelatinous in, within the spinal cord. Now, from this spinal cord, the pain is uh, uh, transferred or uh, projected towards the brain and hence the perception of pain. Now, the point where which at which the large fibers as well as small fibers connect. Now, the large fibers, they transfer uh, sensors like touch, pressure, uh, heat or uh, heat or uh, cold. So, these are the uh, perceptions uh, which are carried by the large fibers. On the other hand, at the same point, the small fibers transfer the uh, pain perceptions, that is your nociception in other words. Now, in a given case, wherein this, uh, uh, this particular substantial gelatinous uh, SG, substantial gelatinous is activated, the small fibers are always overridden by the large fiber perceptions in the presence if the specific area where the pain is being uh, uh, originated is also experiencing some other kind of uh, uh, perceptions like touch or pressure. So, if a particular area, let us say on the skin, the small fibers are transmitting this pain perceptions to the spinal cord. At the same area, if you apply pressure or heat or cold, these uh, perceptions are taken over, uh, uh, play a dominant role. They suppress this pain uh, perceptions and they inhibit this particular pain uh, perceptions or uh, the small fibers at the SG area and, and uh, take over the main route. So, if you look at this uh, diagram, we see both the small fibers as well as the large fibers, they terminate into the substantial gelatinous and thalamus and uh, hence it progresses into the brain or the action system which is rep represented by this uh, box. If you see the dominant nature of these large fibers and at the same time, whenever the small uh, nociceptive fibers are producing a pain sensation, if we activate the large fibers, it takes over the uh, system, it inhibits the small fibers and then progresses along the action system. Now, uh, in the recent times, there is also a slight addition to this particular gate control theory that is a psychological effect. Now, if, if you see the central uh, control, dominating over all of these uh, uh, perceptions is a psychological control. Now, that is where the third angle or the most important angle of uh, uh, pain comes into play wherein there is a psychological effect or a psychological inhibitory process which takes place in any kind of uh, actual or potential tissue damage which can control the pain. Now, if we have to describe the pain, uh, we have few uh, characteristics also called as pain characteristics upon which a uh, patient presenting with pain is described upon. Starting with the anatomical location, obvious that is obvious the, uh, the uh, uh, patient describes the pain and localizes the pain to certain areas or certain specific areas or in the region of a, spe a specific area. Fo followed after that is your intensity with which the patient describes the amount of pain. It might be uh, mild or a moderate or severe upon which he can describe the kind of pain. Now, the mode of onset, how it has been, uh, how it is, uh, has the onset has taken place. Is it sudden in nature or it is, it was slow in uh, uh, onset? It was uh, progressed over a certain period of time. Depending upon that, the kind of pain and the kind of structures which are affected by this, uh, in this, in that particular patient can be estimated upon. So the manner of flow of pain has a pain uh, increased gradually, or it has been increasing and then it has uh, dropped out at certain points of time, and again it has increased at the same uh, uh, time the next day or the next week or the next month. How it has progressed over a period of time? That is a manner of flow of pain. Along with that, the quality of pain. Now, the quality of pain is very important uh, owing to the fact that the specific structure which is affected by the uh, this uh, particular, uh, from which the pain is emanating. Now, that uh, uh, gives, a, uh, the, uh, the quality of pain gives an indication as to which, which uh, particular e element or uh, structure is being affected. It might be burning kind of pain, it might be stabbing kind of pain or a lancinating kind of pain or a stabbing kind of pain or an ice pick kind of pain, depending upon the quality of the type of pain 
we can uh, it gives a slight indication to the dental physician as to which as to which particular structure is being affected now the temporal behavior uh, whether it is uh, continuous or it is paroxysmal that is the temporal uh, nature of this kind of pain also gives an indication the duration obviously whether it is an acute pain or a chronic pain in uh, according to the taxonomic uh, uh, group they have uh, defined uh, chronic pain as any pain which extends more than three months you know so the duration plays an important role as to it is an acute condition or a uh, chronic condition now, the effect on the functional activities how disabling it is to the uh, normal functional activities of the patient also gives an indication as to the seriousness of the kind of a condition or the seriousness of the pain and concomitant symptoms uh, symptoms like is there swelling or is there burning sensation or any uh, uh, pus discharge any other signs and symptoms which is associated with the chief complaint of pain now these are the characteristics upon which the patient describes his pain as well as the uh, dental physician tries to obtain information by using these characteristics so after he obtains the information about uh, uh, the pain, the type of pain or uh, all the characteristics of the pain. The next important uh, step for the dental physician is to assessment of the pain. Now this assessment of the pain can be uh, chair side or even slightly more complicated. As you can see it can be unidimensional or multidimensional. Now unidimensional uh, pain scales are more, uh, rather more uh, simple kind of uh, uh, pain assessment sheets uh, when compared to multidimensional. Unidimensional includes VAS, also called as visual analog scale or numeric scale, the most simplest kind of uh, assessment scales. And also multidimensional scales, most commonly used is a McGill's questionnaire. Now, visual analogs, if you uh, move on to the unidimensional scale, that uh, the most common uh, scale used is a visual analog scale, when it is relatively simple. It, uh, the patient is given a, a, a particular line, uh, wherein uh, it is a 10 centimeter, uh, take for example, a 10 centimeter line, wherein the starting point indicates he has no pain, and the ending point uh, describes it as the most pain, the most severe kind of pain he can experience. So it is subjective, depending upon the patient, totally depending upon the patient perception, the kind of pain or the amount of pain he is uh, suffering from is indicated by this by pointing his finger upon a specific area on this line. Similar kind of uh, scale is a numeric pain scale wherein instead of uh, using a, a 10 uh, centimeter line, they use 10 boxes which uh, each box given a specific number that uh, starting from uh, 0 to uh, 10. Uh, 0 indicating obviously no pain and 10 indicating the most severe kind of pain. Uh, here again the patient is asked his uh, feelings about how he is able to interpret the kind of pain he is undergoing. So it is again totally subjective, depends upon the patient and the patient uh, points his finger at a specific box which indicates the kind of pain he is suffering from. Now these being the most basic kinds of pain most uh, commonly used at chair side, a more complicated uh, kind of uh, scale is a multidimensional scale in which the most commonly used uh, uh, questionnaire is a Magill's questionnaire. Now what this does is it evaluates both the subjective and uh, nature of the pain as well as the objective kind of pain wherein uh, as we, uh, we have seen in the pain theories there is also a psychological effect uh, which uh, has a direct effect upon how much the pain is able uh, the patient is able to perceive the kind of pain he is undergoing as well as the sensory or the effective or evaluative. If you see the total uh, questionnaire is uh, divided into a few, few uh, structures or structured kind of uh, questionnaire wherein a total of uh, uh, 20 groups are uh, specified which tries to, uh, which tries to uh, take in both the sensory that is your subjective how it is affecting the patient, the effective kind of questions and how the dental physician is able to evaluate this kind of subjective information that is the evaluative kind of uh, questions. So all the different angles into which uh, uh, this pain is, uh, pain can be perceived the, by the patient is tried to, uh, uh, the information is uh, gathered by using this uh, kind of uh, uh, questionnaire. Along with these, there are also uh, simple uh, questionnaires, uh, questions relating to the location uh, or the temporal characteristics or the present uh, pain intensity. 
If you look at this, this is a classic uh, Megwell's uh, pain questionnaire. We can see the 20 groups of uh, questions which are given over here. And all the uh, 20 uh, groups, uh, 20 groups of uh, questions are divided into uh, sensory, evaluative and effective uh, kind of uh, questions, which can wholesome evaluate the kind of pain the patient is uh, suffering from. Now the therapeutic modalities, uh, the therapeutic modalities uh, can be basically uh, uh, broadly defined into uh, pharmacological, the medical kind of uh, approach as well as surgical kind of approaches. The most commonly we limit ourselves to the pharmacological therapy and this pharmacological therapy depends upon the kind of pain and the kind of structures from which the pain is emanating from. The most common uh, 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 pharmacological modalities have been uh, listed over, over here. Uh, being the most common being the analgesic agent, which only relieves a kind of uh, only relieves a symptom of pain, and which, uh, as we all know, can be broadly defined into narcotic and non-narcotic. The non-narcotic agents are also called as uh, NSAIDs, the non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory agents. And the narcotics, obviously, the morphine or the co uh, co cocaine uh, derivatives, which uh, are more uh, commonly used in the chronic kind of pain. Now, uh, the next common uh, agent is the anesthetic agents, which can be both topical as well as injected. We all know the 2% uh, lidocaine, 2% xylocaine. All these can be uh, either given topically or uh, 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 injectable kind of uh, local anesthetics. These are all the first line of uh, uh, pharmacological modalities which are meted out to the patient to relieve pain. Next, uh, uh, the anti-inflammatory agents or the muscle relaxants. Well, now we all know the uh, different areas uh, or the different etiologies behind uh, uh, pain producing areas. If all kinds of, uh, if it, for example, if you take the TMJ, the TMJ pain uh, arises uh, either from the bony structures or the soft tissues or the muscles surrounding it. Now, if we uh, diagnose that the muzzle is the basic problem behind the pain uh, in the TMJ patient, then we don't give uh, anti-inflammatory agents or analgesics, uh, the normal analgesics. We directly uh, give, give out the muzzle relaxants. When these uh, medications uh, strive to relax the muzzle fibers, thereby relieving pain. Now, we also have, uh, as I said in the, the uh, pain theories, accepted pain theories, we also have the psychological angle to these uh, pain uh, uh, inhibition uh, modalities that is also uh, contracted by giving antidepressants and anti-anxiety agents. Uh, we also have in few vascular disorders like we have your, which I'll be talking about the cluster headache or the migraine, wherein these are all vascular uh, disorders which results in pain. So vasoactive agents help in uh, uh, combating these specific kinds of uh, structures or a specific kind of diseases which result in pain. Now, apart from that, a more uh, uh, less commonly used, your uh, anti-convulsive agents specific to paroxysmal uh, pains such as your trigeminal neuralgia and the most common kind of neuralgia when anti-convulsive agents are uh, given as a first line of uh, treatment instead of other uh, analgesics or anesthetic agents. Now, the physical therapy, uh, as we said, if we go back to the pain theory, wherein I was talking about the large fibers as well as the soft, uh, small fibers, we are, I told you that at that given instant, if we can induce a kind of uh, 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 pressure uh, agents or heat agents or cold agents at that per, uh, particular area, which is resulting in pain, we can, we can override the pain signals and these large fibers take up these uh, sensations and progress to the CNS. Now that is the basic principle upon which the various physical therapies are uh, based upon. If you look at uh, uh, the, uh, the most commonly used physical therapies, you can see each and every uh, modality uh, aims to uh, initiate or uh, activate these large fibers. If we take the ultrasound into uh, consideration, ultrasound are basically sound waves which uh, result in uh, energy or a heat production in that specific, uh, specific area. Now these ultrasound waves are used at, uh, in specific cases to produce heat and this heat is taken up by the large fibers and the heat sensation overrides the pain sensation and thereby relieves the patient of pain. 
Similarly, if you look into the electrogalvanic stimulation, now this also produces heat waves. Now, tense that is an electrical uh, signals, uh, electrical signals which are converted into heat. This again is a kind of a physical therapy wherein the large fibers are activated. Now, acupuncture. Acupuncture is basically pressure uh, points wherein specific needles are uh, inserted uh, to a specific depth at a few pressure points in the body which are known to activate the pressure uh, uh, feelings uh, or uh, the activate the large fibers. So, in case of few chronic kind of uh, uh, pain uh, suffering patients, we use acupuncture to activate the large fibers by uh, using these pressure points. Now, diathermy, it is also a kind of heat production uh, system wherein short waves are used in this kind of modality which results in heat uh, production and this activates the large fibers. Now, conversely, we have been talking about how the electrical or various type of signals are converted into heat. Now, cryotherapy is wherein you are you're, uh, using cold sensation. Your cryo is ice. So, you are using ice therapy or cooling therapy to relieve pain in that specific area. All these modalities basically uh, are meant to achieve uh, the primary uh, target that is your uh, activation of your large fibers so that it can override the nociceptive uh, signals from the small fibers. Now, after assessing this uh, kind of pain, we uh, just to have a brief uh, idea upon which the various uh, classification modes upon which your pain can be classified upon. Uh, the most accepted kind of uh, classification was uh, given by Okeson in which he has described these uh, pain uh, symptoms or uh, uh, different types of pain into two axes, your axis 1 and axis 2. Axis 1 basically deals with the other kinds of uh, physical modalities or physical causes of pain and axis 2 deals with the psychological uh, conditions which can result in pain. Now, in axis that is your physical conditions, we have your somatic pain and neuropathic pain. Now, in uh, somatic pain, we have something called as superficial somatic and deep somatic. Now, superficial somatic uh, again can be subclassified into cutaneous or mucogingival depending upon your whether the uh, pain is arising from the skin or uh, or from the oral mucosa. Or the deep somatic pain, which includes visceral pain and musculoskeletal pain. Now, of importance to the dental physicians are the musculoskeletal pain and the visceral pain, wherein you can see any kind of pulpal pain has been classified as visceral pain that is your uh, if it uh, if a patient uh, complains of any pulpitis or uh, acute peripheral collapses all these kinds of pain have been described as visceral pain whereas on the other hand if we take into the muscle pain or the tmj structures the tmj uh, complex from which the pain arises or the tmds or the periodontal pain your uh, simple periodontitis or aggressive periodontitis all the periodontal structures from which the pain arises have been described as musculoskeletal pain. Now, why this differentiation is important for us? It is important because uh, while treating this particular patient, depending upon uh, which kind of pain are we uh, are trying to eliminate over here, that is uh, that uh, specific modality of uh, analgesic or uh, non or uh, non narcotic analgesics can be given. Now, we all know that in NSAIDs. Uh, the different groups of uh, medications which are uh, uh, given out to the patient is dependent upon the kind of pain. Now, few of the uh, NSAIDs have more penetratable power uh, so that it can penetrate into the musculoskeletal system. So, it is more uh, preferred over there or few other medications do not have such uh, type uh, kind of uh, uh, penetrating power and they are mostly used for visceral kind of pain. So, that is where the importance of how these pains are classified is uh, important to the dental physician. The neuropathic pain, most of the neuralgias or the vascular uh, uh, disorders uh, such as your migraine or your cluster headache or your tension type of headache or your trigeminal neuralgia, glossopharyngeal neuralgia, all these neuralgias and headaches can be classified as neuropathic pain which can be uh, further uh, classified as whether it is episodic in nature when we have a certain trigger points and the pain is uh, pain exists for few uh, minutes or few hours and then there is complete relieving of the pain and there is uh, another uh, episode of pain whether it is episodic kind or if it is a continuous kind of a neuropathic pain now the axis 2 as i said deals with more the uh, more of the psychological angle of uh, pain production that is a various uh, psychological conditions which can result in pain most commonly chronic kind of pain 
whether it be mood disorders or anxiety disorders, somatoform disorders or any other con psychological conditions which have a psychological angle to the pain production. Now moving on to the most common uh, kind of neuralgias or headaches, uh, uh, speaking uh, from either from the exam point of view, uh, the most common kind of uh, neuralgias, uh, most common kind of questions which are uh, posed to the students is about neuralgias and headaches. And among neuralgias, the most uh, the most common as well as the most important kind of uh, neuralgia is your trigeminal neuralgia. As we all know, in the various cranial nerves, uh, the fifth cranial nerve is a trigeminal, trigeminal nerve and the neuralgias which r uh, result or arise from this nerve or its various branches is known as trigeminal neuralgia. It is not also known as tick uh, dilorex uh, uh, because of the tick-like uh, nature of this uh, pain. Now, uh, as I said, it is a disorder of the fifth uh, cranial nerve. The most important cause uh, because of which uh, trigeminal neuralgia takes place is any vascular malformations or tumors which affect the initial trigeminal ganglion at the at the Meckel's cave. We all know the trigeminal neuralgia uh, at the Meckel's cave from the uh, from the ganglion present in the Meckel's cave divides into the three structures, the three uh, divisions of uh, fifth cranial nerve: your ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular uh, divisions. And this trigeminal uh, ganglion, when affected. Uh, by uh, by the clo uh, uh, by vascular malformations or tumors in the Meckel's cave, because of its close proximity to other vascular structures, this neuralgia takes place. Now the clinical features; these are very typical of uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Very classical symptoms, wherein the uh, patient complains of severe lancinating kind of pain or a stabbing kind of pain, which is. Uh, as I said, in the pa uh, pain characteristics, wherein the type of pain is very important to uh, actually localize or zero upon a kind of a disease. Now, this kind of pain or a, uh, a type of pain is very typical to this uh, neuralgia or trigeminal neuralgia, wherein the patient complains of a stabbing or lancinating kind of pain, which is only typical to this condition. Now, apart from that, these are there are some uh, trigger points which are uh, located along the distribution of the trigeminal nerve and depending upon which branch is affected whether be it the uh, ophthalmic or the maxillary nerve or the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve that uh, uh, nerve distribution areas along the nerve distribution areas we have the trigger points which when triggered tr uh, triggered by any common uh, uh, action of the uh, of the person or the patient can result in episodes of this neuralgia. Now, simple uh, daily day-to-day uh, -day, uh, activities like brushing or uh, washing your face or uh, shaving, all these, if uh, they uh, uh, actually trigger these uh, po trigger points along the distribution of the nerve, can result in a severe uh, episode of trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, so, predominantly, you see uh, these. Uh, Long-term uh, sufferers from trigeminal neuralgia, they are pretty uh, uh, shabbily uh, 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 arranged in their daily uh, mode of life that they are unshaven beards or uh, unwashed uh, faces. That is primarily because they are uh, afraid of uh, uh, trying to, uh, afraid of uh, activating these trigger points by, uh, by these normal daily activities. So that is an indication as to the chronicity of this uh, trigeminal neuralgia and the severity with which these neural uh, paroxysmal episodes of pain uh, take place in that particular patient. Now, these are most commonly uh, seen in uh, women uh, more than uh, men and uh, middle to old age people are mostly affected uh, by this condition. Now, if you see the uh, distribution of the trigeminal neuralgia and its uh, various uh, branches, we see the mandibular area the maxillary area and the ophthalmic area wherein along the distribution of these nerves and the branches are the trigger points. Now, if you see the area of distribution of the various uh, uh, structures. Now, if you see the anatomical structure of the Meckel's cave and the trigeminal ganglion, we see a large part of the uh, uh, ganglion provides to the maxillary area followed by the next uh, area of provided by the mandibular 
and very minimal part of the trigeminal ganglion uh, gives rise to the third branch that are uh, also known as your ophthalmic branch. Now because of owing to the surface area from which this branch arises from, the most commonly kind of uh, affected, uh, it is directly proportional to the mostly commonly kind of affected branch in this particular uh, condition. So depending uh, upon the surface area, the most commonly affected is your maxillary because it uh, uh, occupies a large area in the trigeminal ganglion followed by the mandibula and followed by the ophthalmic nerve. Now, as I said, the, uh, there are trigger zones for this kind of uh, uh, neuralgia uh, condition that is trigeminal neuralgia depending upon uh, which uh, nerve is affected. The management uh, part, uh, it is uh, primarily divided into the first line of uh, treatment and second line of treatment and uh, most commonly used uh, modalities are the medical management, uh, uh, medical mod modalities followed by surgical modalities. Uh, surgical modalities are uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, they're uh, delayed in uh, they're not most commonly used. They are used only in uh, patients with chronic kind of uh, uh, chronic uh, patients with chronic episodes of uh, this trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, medical treatment the most commonly used is a uh, carbamazepine or uh, uh, in, uh, uh, Tegretol, which is a, a brand name. Uh, mostly used as 100 milligrams BID. Uh, can the maximum dosage is reached up to uh, 1,200 or 1,300 milligrams? It is given twice or thrice daily, depending upon the uh, acuteness or the chronicness of the patient uh, of these episodes or the severity of these episodes. Carbamazepine is given as the first line of treatment. So the basic problem with carbamazepine is its usage on a long-term basis results in blood dyscreases. That is. The first uh, uh, investigation, which has to be ta uh, which has to be done, to on uh, uh, for patients on long-term use of carbamazepine, is your blood report where there is decrease in all the blood corpuscles. So that is the most uh, important side effect of uh, carbamazepine. Now, patients with chronic uh, 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 more chronic kind of uh, 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 who are chronically affected by this uh, disease and uh, who are on long term use of carbamazepine and have this uh, blood dyscreases, they are uh, not given this carbamazepine and then uh, they are given a second line of drugs that is a baclofen or your gabapentin. Now gabapentin is the second most common kind of uh, drug which is given uh, in patients who are who have the side effects of carbamazepine and uh, gabapentin is an anti uh, convulsive uh, agent. Uh, given as 900 uh, milligrams to 2700 milligrams BID or TID, the maximum dose up to 2700. And apart from that, patients who are not responsive to these uh, kind of medical modalities, either the carbozepine or the anti convulsive agents like gabapentin, as I said, uh, patients who are non responsive to uh, carbamazepine or uh, other second line of anti convulsants like gabapentin, they are given other uh, uh, modalities like your uh, baclofen or phenytoin or clonazepam. Baclofen 10 milligrams per day is given once daily. A maximum dosage of 30 milligrams can be attained. The most important side effect again being uh, 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 liver uh, damage or renal uh, toxicity which have to be taken care at a periodic, uh, uh, periodic times. And uh, we have clonazepam. Uh, max, uh, given as 0.1 milligrams, uh, a maximum of 0.3 can be attained. And apart from this, we also have TCAs or tricyclic antidepressants uh, such as uh, emetritalin or pemozide, which are also used uh, as uh, one of the uh, alternative kind of medical modalities for trigeminal neuralgia. Now, if you go into the surgical options wherein the patient is totally unresponsive, non-responsive to any kind of medical treatments, medical modalities, or wherein the medical modalities have proved to be uh, ineffective in dealing with the severity of the uh, severity of the uh, pain or severity of the episodes or have been ineffective in uh, reducing the frequency of these attacks then a surgical option or an invasive uh, option is uh, opted for uh, basically as i said the basic problem lies in the trigeminal ganglion uh, because of its close proximity to the vascular malformations or tumors within the ganglion. It is, uh, the basic uh, idea behind surgical, uh, surgical modalities is to negate that particular uh, root cause for trigeminal neuralgia. That is to 
take out that uh, trisomy uh, ganglion totally obliterate the ganglion or take out the uh, uh, cause or uh, the any uh, ballooning effect because of the tumors or, or muscular formations upon the, uh, the trisomy ganglion so if you see the various uh, modalities we have glycerol rhizotomy wherein we use glycerol uh, as a chemical agent in totally uh, destroying the particular uh, ganglion or balloon compressions or uh, microvascular de uh, decompression both of them primarily uh, aim to uh, release the pressure which is uh, uh, which is applied uh, because of the muscular formations onto the trisomal ganglion thereby resulting in trisomal neuralgias so the relieving of the pressure totally relieves out the uh, uh, neurologic uh, condition of the patient and other kinds of uh, uh, modalities your gamma knife uh, surgery or your radio frequency thermal rhizotomy all these basically are end uh, stages or the end uh, last ditch efforts to relieve the patient from a uh, neuralgia by totally destroying the uh, ganglion now the mo other most common uh, the next most common kind of neuralgia is a post post herpetic neuralgia as we all know the more uh, uh, in uh, vascular uh, diseases we have this herpes zoster infection uh, which is caused because of the varicella zoster uh, infection vz virus uh, it has uh, more, um, very common uh, commonly seen in the general population it uh, results in vesicles both extraorally as well as intraorally now in few patients what happens is after the patient is uh, relieved from this herpes zoster infection or when the patient is in the end stages of uh, uh, this uh, particular disease there is a persistent kind of uh, pain which uh, uh, which is seen in these patients for the next uh, two to three months or more than two to three months and that is when uh, we apply the term as post herpetic neuralgia wherein this persistent pain if it uh, persists for more than one month even after the resolution of these uh, signs and symptoms of this infection the term post herpetic neuralgia is given uh, more of around 50 percent of uh, patients who uh, come up with herpes zoster infection is uh, going to uh, this post herpetic neuralgia and uh, most commonly uh, there is uh, gradual resolution of this persistent pain and there is uh, after a few uh, period of time it gradually resolves by itself now in case wherein it doesn't resolve by itself then we go in for the modalities to resolve it now what are the chief complaints in this uh, post hepatic neuralgia it is a persistent pain there is a sensory deficit in that particular area resulting in paresthesia or hyperthesia now paresthesia is altered sensations or uh, altered uh, sensory uh, sensations in that particular area now hyperesthesia is even a small uh, stimulus which might not produce pain in a normal individual will produce pain in this kind of individual because it is hyperesthetic now uh, that is called hyperesthesia now along with these we have a sensory deficits in that particular area and uh, the most important or uh, uh, differentiating factor from other neuralgias is there is no trigger zone in this kind of patients now the management if at all necessary if the uh, pain doesn't resolve by itself the most uh, common kind of uh, topical therapy is your anesthetics your uh, two percent lidocaine or specific to this kind of neuralgia the most common kind of uh, modality is a capsaicin which is nothing but a chili powder extract uh, refined chili powder uh, chili extract which has a, uh, a very good effect in dealing with post herpetic neuralgia patients now the basic action is it basically activates substance p which is an inhibitory kind of uh, uh, inhibitory kind of substance for pain uh, uh, signals within the body so this capsaicin helps in uh, releasing out this substance p and thereby relieving the pain in post herpetic neurology patients apart from that we also have tcs as i said tricyclic antidepressants among which there is a subclass called ssris which are nothing uh, which are uh, a short form for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors now uh, this uh, serotonin as i told in the previous uh, slides uh, is basically helps in inhibiting the pain signals now what happens in the body is whenever serotonin is produced it inhibits the pain signals from uh, from carrying out to the central nervous system now but this serotonin is uh, uh, re 
taken back into the body, the level of serotonin uh, gradually reduces in the uh, uh, normal body, thereby the pain signals uh, again start to uh, uh, go, go from the periphery to the CNS. Uh, system, uh, CNS. Now what these uh, uh, drugs do is, the reuptake of serotonin within the body is inhibited. That's why it is called as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So thereby it prolongs the time for which the serotonin is uh, seen within the body. Thereby uh, prolonging the effect of serotonin that is inhibition of pain. Now as, you all, as I said, this is uh, primarily seen in the end stages of this viral infection or just after uh, this viral infection totally resolves. Famcyclovir, that is an antiviral drug, has also been found as a useful drug in dealing with this condition. The next most common kind of neuropathic pain uh, uh, or a neuralgic kind of pain is a glossopharyngeal neuralgia. Now this, <laughs> just like a trigeminal neuralgia, uh, basically arises because of any uh, intracranial or extracranial tumors or ma vascular malformations which result in impingement upon the glossopharyngeal neuralgia uh, uh, glossopharyngeal nerve that is a ninth cranial nerve now this was first described by uh, theodore uh, weinsberg in 19, uh, 1910 and to give a brief history it is basically uh, uh, described in a patient who uh, uh, chronically uh, complained of pain at the areas of uh, uh, innovation of this uh, ninth cranial nerve now uh, as long as he was alive the uh, doctors were not able to uh, classify this kind of pain or uh, describe what kind of pain or uh, find out why this uh, pain is uh, the uh, patient is suffering from this kind of pain but after the death wherein the autopsy was done the physician found out uh, that there was an uh, intracranial tumor which was impinging upon the ninth cranial nerve because of which the patient was experiencing this pain episodes in areas pertaining to a distribution of the ninth cranial nerve now that is the main predominant etiology behind uh, glossopharyngeal neuralgia. Now uh, uh, unlike trigeminal neuralgia, there is no gender predilection. Uh, both men and women are equally affected and uh, primarily in the middle aged or the older age people. Now just like uh, trigeminal neuralgia, it is unilateral, uh, paroxysmal that is episodic. The pain, there are trigger zones in this uh, patient also. The only point of difference being trigeminal neuralgia, uh, the trigger zones are found along the distribution of fifth cranial nerve, that is the mandibular maxillary or ophthalmic divisions, whereas in uh, uh, glossopharyngeal it is along the uh, distribution of the ninth cranial nerve. Predominantly, internally, if you see the posterior part of the palate, the soft palate, which uh, it innovates, so any chewing, talking, or swallowing, the normal uh, daily structures which uh, uh, result in a uh, touching of this or uh, irritation of this soft palate of the posterior region results in uh, these trigger zones producing the uh, bouts of uh, uh, glossopharyngeal neuralgias. Now just like in uh, trigeminal neuralgia uh, because of the similar symptoms the modalities also are the same be it the medical modalities primary uh, medical modality being your carbamazepine 100 milligrams uh, incremental, uh, incremental uh, uh, increase up to uh, 1,800 milligrams per day uh, or if unresponsive, uh, gabapentin is given as a medical modality or if both the medical modalities are not uh, effective, we go for surgical uh, modalities just like in trigeminal neuralgia, we have total destruction of the uh, uh, ganglion, the glossopharyngeal uh, ninth cranial nerve ganglion or relieving of the pressure which is produced because of the intracranial or extracranial tumors or vascular malformations. Now, that being the neuropathical uh, conditions, common neuropathical conditions, we have another class of primary vascular disorders, wherein basically it is because of the vasodilation of the uh, structure of the blood vessels in near vicinity of uh, nerve uh, ganglions or nerve fibers, which produce these uh, kind of uh, uh, neuralgias uh, or primary vascular disorders, among which the most common kind is your cluster headache also known as sphenophyllotine uh, neuralgia. Basically, the ganglion which is affected in this kind of uh, condition is a nasal ganglion. And uh, as the anatomy suggests the nasal ganglion, the, also the signs and symptoms of the pain which is uh, seen in these patients are also limited to that particular area wherein the 
fibers uh, coming out from the nasal ganglion are affected over there. That is predominantly your eye, your zygoma, the upper part of the maxilla, or the nasal uh, bridge or the nasal root. So these are the areas upon, uh, wherein your paroxysmal uh, episodes are seen. Now etiology again, as I said, this is a basically a primary vascular disorder. It is basically because of vasodilation of internal maxillary artery, which uh, as you know, it is a branch of the external carotid artery. Now clinical features, as I said, the nasal ganglion is affected. So predominantly the areas around it, your uh, the eyes, your uh, maxilla, the ear, the uh, base of the nose, the beneath the zygoma, all these areas are primarily affected. And uh, it is a rapid onset uh, a, a kind of a, a neuralgia. Uh, and uh, the most interesting feature in this uh, neuralgia uh, is which sets us apart from other kind of neuralgias is it's it rep repeticity. That is, it is also called as alarm clock headache primarily because the attacks are uh, coincidentally uh, are uh, seen at the same kind same point of time on ev every day as the previous day so there is a repetitivity or a biological rhythm to these kind of uh, neuralgias hence its name uh, alarm clock headache now it is also called as ice pick uh, headache primarily because the pain which is experienced uh, in this condition uh, in the ear uh, in the eyes uh, looks like there is a uh, cold ice uh, icicle or an ice pick which is pierced through the ear, uh, through the eye. This is a, a classic symptom or the patient complaint which is normally seen, uh, normally experienced, wherein the patient complains of piercing kind of a cold sensation kind of uh, a pain through the uh, eye. We can uh, directly uh, estimate or uh, suspect uh, this kind of neuralgia if such kind of uh, uh, complaints are given. Now the treatment it's uh, a slightly different where uh, corticosteroids predominantly as uh, given over here uh, systemic corticosteroids predominantly your prednisolone uh, ranging from 30 to 60 uh, milligrams per day in divided doses depending upon the severity and depending upon the frequency upon uh, of this uh, neuralgic condition. The other most uh, effective kind of uh, therapy uh, for uh, uh, cluster headache is a lithium therapy. Now lithium has been found to be highly useful in contracting the effects of uh, uh, this uh, cluster headache uh, symptoms. But the main problem lies on its chronic use. On chronic use lithium uh, therapy results in renal toxicity. So renal uh, uh, patients or old age patients or uh, uh, these kind of patients have to be uh, dealt more carefully in the, in this uh, when they are experience, experiencing this condition because of its potential renal damaging uh, 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 re potential renal damage which lithium can cause. The last kind of uh, headache or a vascular kind of uh, disorder which is seen is a tension type of headache which is the most common seen on a daily basis affects about 99% of the general population. It is most commonly seen in uh, uh, women and uh, men both alike in, uh, in daily day-to-day uh, -day life also called as tension type of headache or contraction band kind of headache uh, which is most commonly seen. We see uh, people uh, holding their heads uh, bilaterally. We uh, see pa patients holding the frontal head or the back uh, areas and uh, it normally uh, progresses or uh, gradually uh, becomes more severe as the day progresses and the, since the stress and the tension also increases as the day progresses. So these are the uh, signs and symptoms of this particular headache. This is predominantly the etiology uh, being tension or stress which results in this kind of headache. Now we also know uh, as the day progresses we commonly uh, if you have ever wondered why we commonly uh, most commonly hold our head uh, in the pericranial areas or in the flex and neck. So these are basically the trigger points, the cervical muscles as well as the pericranial muscles wherein we commonly hold our head uh, and our necks. These are the trigger areas for this kind of tension type of headache. So that being the trigger points, it affects both men and women uh, more commonly in the working class wherein the stress and tension is on the higher side. So uh, it progresses from the front to the back areas. It's like a band from the frontal area back to the occipital area. So it affects as a band. So hence its name as a uh, tension or muscle contraction headache. 
So this is uh, a chronic kind of uh, headache which the general population affects, uh, is affected and uh, in most of the cases uh, there is no need for uh, uh, any medical uh, intervention. It is just a psychological effect. So a relaxation it gra gradually relieves by itself. But uh, in few cases if it is more severe in nature then we go in for the medical uh, treatments. So these are the uh, various uh, common conditions uh, with which the patient presents himself uh, to the dental physician. Now understanding the nature of this pain, understanding from which structures it has come up from or uh, understanding the uh, various angles to the pain uh, complaint because uh, deciphering the kind of uh, pain which the patient uh, is uh, experiencing, we have to decipher whether it is more psychological or it is physiological. Now, deciphering that particular part has been the most difficult uh, period, a a difficult uh, aspect in dealing with uh, primary pain patients. So, getting to know the dental physician has uh, is uh, he has to know the which kind of uh, uh, structures are being affected. And uh, to deal with that kind of uh, uh, a pain, the specific kind of medical modality or surgical modality which has to be given to completely satisfy the patient. Thank you.